Hello, welcome back to coverage here at U.S. Nationals. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Reed Duke. The team captain for the U.S., Reed, by the way, as you, as you watch this unfold, we are, of course, telling the story of who's going to play in uh, the World Magic Cup for the United States here. And, uh, well, we've got one of them sitting right next to me. That's you, Mr. Reed Duke. And then, uh, well, we're going to find out who you're going to get to battle with here this weekend. So a nice little, nice little weekend. Uh, Sky Terror to kick things off for Zach Medford. It has to be best case scenario for him is that thing's just a steady stream of two damage probably for the rest of the game. Oh, exactly what you want to start with on turn two if you're a red-white aggressive deck. Oh, man. Oh, this is man. A, King Jolly Sunwing, too. Two just very far above par creatures. Um, the s sort of good, sort of bad news for Huey is that he was uh, is going to be unable to block these flying creatures anyway, so the ability of King Jolly Sunwing is... Uh, its impact is going to be lessened until Zach Bedford starts playing ground creatures, but definitely, I mean, facing down four points of damage in the air when you're a blue-green deck with not that much removal, it's, it's not ideal. This is like a super clear bluff spot for Jensen as well, right? Yeah, look at that. That was a... Uh, I don't know if he is. I, I haven't got a chance to look at his hand, but I would expect Jensen to attack here like 90% of the time or something, regardless of what's in his hand. Yeah, it's perfect, and I think Zach Medford almost is never going to block because, you know, you're not in danger of getting raced on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, and you just, it would be disastrous to lose your your flying attacker to something that otherwise couldn't answer it. God, so I would... It's, it's, it is a great spot for bluff. It's, it's be perfect. so tempted, Reed, to block there. <laughs> if you're against Huey, I mean... I mean it. Be, it. I just would be, be like, right. you're attacking, like, such a high percentage, and... Maybe he's too greedy. Like, how good is it if he blocks and just eats the Ixali's Keeper? It's quite strong. It's quite strong, yeah, but it, it also depends on your vision for how the game is going to play out. Right. If you think your best chance of winning is just attacking four times with these two flying creatures, then that's the plan that you should be on, and you should more or less ignore what's going on on the ground. By the way, this curve out from Zach Medford, what the... <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent. Sky Terror can jolly Sunwing Thrash of Raptors. My goodness. It's only the fifth turn of the game. He's got nine power swinging in here. And here's the power of uh, Kinjali Sunwing. William Jensen played a 3-2 creature, but it comes in play tapped and can't even block the Thrash of Raptors. Finally, he takes his uh, foot off the gas a little and plays just a two-drop here. Bishop's Soldier for Medford. Jensen is continuing to use that treasure map. Of course, the real issue that Jensen has at this point is not getting the map transformed or any of that stuff. It's surviving long enough to get the value out of it. I don't know how he's going to do it. Uh, well, one, one kind of nice thing about the treasure map is you can use it as a burst of mana on the turn that you transform it. True. Now, you tap it, you scry, you add the third counter, it's going to transform and stay tapped as a land, but you can use the three treasures that it makes right away. Uh, Definitely not ideal because then point. Those, those treasures are not around to draw cards with later. But if William Jensen wants to get the Verdant Sun's avatar that I see in his hand uh, into play quickly, that is one option available to him. Looks like he scribed to the bottom. Oh, thinking during his upkeep. Okay, so he found one with the wind, which can allow him to potentially block a flying creature, but... Yeah, that is actually an interesting draw for him. That might keep the Kinjali Sunwing back. All right, so here we go. Treasure Tro is going to hit, and he's going to get, what, three uh, treasure here. And like you said, likely to just use this as a burst of mana, which is a great use for it here since he's so far behind. Oh, he's got Verdant Sun Avatar, too. Wow, and he even had enough mana to cast it this turn. That could buy him some a ton of time here. Yeah, so that puts him up to 10. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's still close, though, isn't it, Reed? I think he is dead because I think there's a sure strike in Zach Medford's hand. So oh, combined okay. with the trample on Thrash of Raptors, that should be just enough to do it. You know, we'll call it seven in the air. Both creatures get blocked and three trample goes through. That should do it. Oh my, is that a, did he draw a hijack as well? Hits keep coming for Zach Medford. 
Yeah, it looks like he did, though. He's only got two red mana, so he can either do one or the other, but they're both lethal. Yeah, he can decide which one he, he is more willing to show, reveal the information. Jensen's just seeing if there's any way he can block here because he knows if he gets to untap, the Verdant Sun's avatar can completely dominate this type of scenario, but uh, nope, Zach Medford with a sick curve there from his red-white deck. It matches his shirt, and he just jammed. Wow, that was a beating. Yeah, that was just a great showing from Zach Medford. He's got to be thrilled to start a draft like that, you know, Great performance from his deck and, and beating, you know, the hottest player in Magic right now. Oh, he's hot, all right. 10 out of 10. So in the meantime, Marshall, we got extra intel on, on William Jensen's draft after we spoke to him. Uh, yeah, Maria mentioned it on the stream. We should talk about it here, though. Okay, so we saw him first pick Dreamcaller Siren. Second pick, he took River Herald's Boon over Fire Cannon Blast, which from our seat looked like a... Uh, you know, preferencing blue-green and, and going for a merfolk deck um, instead of moving into blue-red pirates. Mm -hmm. The reason is the player to his right first picked v Vance's Blasting Cannons, you know, face up as a double face card. So, so Huey knew that he was not going to be past red cards and therefore his options were limited and, and he didn't want to go straight into It made a pirates. lot more sense from that point, right? Yeah, yeah. Because both you and I were kind of like, eh, don't you just want to take the burn spell here? And, you know... And Jensen actually said he, he would have preferred it, but like you said, given the information he had, it didn't make much sense. Quick look in. Stephen Neal's playing against Dan Ward. What are these two up to over on this table? Dan Let's Ward see. looks to be exploring, although he is in his combat step. So just, I guess, the player's agreeing to a shortcut there no. to keep the cards revealed. Yeah, I think he's blocking. I think he just crewed up the... Dan, Dan did. Sure, the sure. I, I'm referring to the uh, Desperate Castaways face up on the top of his library there. Oh, I see. Which, yeah, you're not, right. Not technically the way it should be displayed, but okay if both players, you know, agree to that to, as, as a way of uh, keeping track of known information. Boy, we picked a rough spot to, to, to cut in on. We don't really know no what's idea going what the on, hell's going on in the here. game here. <laughs> this is just nonsense. It seems like Conqueror's, Conqueror's Galleon is, is going to be exiled and come back untapped after combat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, it, it's, it's a question of whether the explore trigger on Emperor's ba Vanguard has been missed. It seems to me that, Dan, you know, from mm. Dan Ward's body language that he's saying... If the Conqueror's Galleon has already come back into play at end of combat, then where did the trigger go must be missed, you know? Which I think that is a valid way of interpreting things. We'll have to let the judges make the final decision. That makes sense. And then maybe they're just uh, trying to figure out if he acknowledged the trigger, you know, from the Emperor's Vanguard there. Me, you know, the, I saw Dan kind of like tapping and no it looks like no it looks like you missed it all right yeah and down on the floor they said the judge agreed with dan it was a missed trigger so the conqueror's galleon though is transformed it's just he doesn't get that free explore value which is well it's a travesty <laughs> i mean you, you got to get all you can game looks like it's starting to get kind of interesting, too. There's a famous moment, Marshall, in uh, the finals of one of the early Pro Tours. Steve omahoney Schwartz had a card called Crazed Armadon, which mm -hmm. something it, where it gets pumped up and then you sacrifice it at the end of the turn after you attack. Mm -hmm. So he made a big attack. The players marked the life totals and he put it in his graveyard, sacrificed it at the end of the turn. Uh, but the problem was the judges ruled that that meant he was skipping to the end of his turn and he didn't get a chance to play a creature in his post-combat main phase. Ooh. So just one of those subtle uh, sequencing errors ended up being really, really costly. Ooh, and that's that, brutal. That, that was uh, one of the more memorable moments in Pro Tour history, at least for me as a viewer. Um, all right, well, it sounds like our main match is about to get back underway, so why don't we go back over there? This one's moving pretty slowly. We've only seen about half a turn there. And boy, these guys are already underway. So Zach has a nest robber. Man, he is playing aggro. 
Look at this. Frenzied Raptor now. The, this curve out, though, compared to the one we saw before, not quite up to speed. Well, it's, you know, two drop, three drop, but at least these ones are blockable. I right. Think we're, we're likely to see the Water Trap Weaver trade with the Frenzied Raptor. And uh, look, William Jensen forced to play chart a course, and he is electing to leave his creature on defense rather than attack to get the raid. Um, just really focused on protecting himself and finding his, his forest. Yeah, he's just too big of a threat to be able to trade it with the uh, frenzied raptor here for Jensen. He has to leave that thing back. But like you said, digging for forests and so far not finding any. Yeah, so next turn is going to be a very big draw step for William Jensen. He has a prosperous pirates, but no fifth mana. So if he, if he can draw any basic land, even an island off the top of his library and play that, um, he's going to be able to deploy the cards in his hand. If not, he's going to be stuck and taking a massive amount of damage from these white red dinosaurs reasonable turn here for medford oh did he brick he says go oh that is no good for william huey jensen this one's falling apart quickly on him he got ran over in the first game from a great curve out by zach and zach has once again curved out nicely here though not quite with the uncommons and rares that we saw before instead just a big pile of commons but hey they're getting the job done oh my goodness and look zach medford has a Stormfleet Pyromancer in hand, so he is just oh, no. crossing his fingers. Please don't let William Jensen block so that I can finish off the creature after combat at no loss. I mean, it's not even that bad for him if 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 he trades the nest robber for his yeah. creature. But then he just goes upstairs with the Pyromancer. Oh, bad spot here for Jensen. Awful spot. Zach Medford really putting the screws to him here with this red-white aggro deck. And Jensen's looking down at his hand. He knows what a critical turn this is. So if I'm in Huey's seat here, my thought process is, let me not think about what's in Zach's hands. Let, let me decide how I can have the best chance of beating what's on the board. And I, that's why I would also make the same play of not blocking. You, you need the creature to hold off Frenzied Raptor next turn. And if hmm. Zach has a, has a good follow-up play, he you're just in trouble. found a Water Trap Weaver. This is kind of interesting, Reed. Okay, so locks down Thrash of Raptors, threatens to trade with any of the other attackers on Zach Medford's side. Uh, Wouldn't be shocked to see Zach just ship him in here. He can trade off the Frenzied Raptor, but still get in for five and leave Jensen with no board. Looks to me like he again has that Sure Strike, so he's oh, trying yeah. to think ahead about would he rather cash in the Sure Strike to save his creature in combat or to deal three extra damage. Looks like he's going to save it for next turn as, as just a Lava Spike to finish off. William Jensen. Might even see him attack with that 0-3 as, as one extra body to right. point it at. Can tell his callers, like, put me in, coach. I'm ready. Yeah, and that's going to do it. Jensen has to extend the hand. Just mana issues for him there. Never saw that green mana source. He had some pretty good tools in hand to get out. But me meanwhile, all credit to Zach Medford, who brought a solid curve-out deck and curved out twice on Jensen, really giving him no breathing room. You know, you look at cards like Charter Course, even at just two mana, that kind of setback was really tough for Huey to recover from because Zach said, I'm not playing stuff like that. I'm playing cards that get the job done and get the job done now, and he just did. So Jensen picks up his first loss. Very impressive showing from Zach Medford. If he can, you know, continue to, to have smooth draws with his really nice red-white aggressive deck, and he's already beaten what, you know, many people would consider the toughest player in the pod, uh, although Seth Manfield's also a great player. He's in great shape. He's just got to keep it going. By the way, Steven did win that first game that we uh, popped in on here. Uh, Rivers Rebuke finished off uh, the, the table to make uh, Steve win that game. He also had the uh, ability to buy it back repeatedly with that Conqueror's Galleon that was transformed. That's pretty sweet. Though apparently didn't need it to get the <laughs> job done. Here's Dead Eye Tormentor doing what Dead Eye Tormentor does. It's very strange to see a Cobbled Wings in the main here, or in the deck here for Dan Ward with a blue-black deck. Right, especially since many of the creatures in blue-black pirates have flying to begin with. Yeah, or, you know, what are you going to do, give your Deadeye Tormentor flying? Oh, it's a two-powered flyer, you know. That's, that is not where you want to be. 
Yeah, a little bit of a, a ragtag crew. Dan <laughs> Ward's pirate <laughs> ship right now. <laughs> Skittering the heart stopper <laughs> flying over the top. I want to see it. Oh, I think I understand. Maybe Cobbled Wings is uh, the tiebreaker in favor of playing it was two copies of Desperate Castaways. So just being able to attack with that. Okay, um, okay. Still not good. Above par two drop. Yeah, I'm really not loving right. that. But you do what you got to do. Now, you give me a Pirate's Cutlass. Well, then I'm in. Now, now you sign me up. <laughs> By the way, we got our, our dream here, Reed. Dead Eye Tormentor with Cobbled Wings on it. We have made a Windrake. Ah, and conspicuous that Dan Ward leaves up one island there when he does have the Skittering Heart Stopper in play. Could be representing Dive Down. Yeah, I mean, he, he attacked with it anyway. It's like, what is it going to do? Fight, maybe. <clears throat> it's possible. It does open the door for Stephen Neal to fight it. I believe that Dan has not blocked here. He saw through this little attack. This is certainly a, a hallmark of Ixalan draft of the two, two players just attacking past each other. You know, you're a sucker if, you're, if, if, if you declare a block yeah. sometimes when the game plays out like Blocking's this. Blocking for suckers. <laughs> Dan's going to attack with the team, though even though it looks like a big attack, it's actually just five. Still reasonable, though. Yeah, both players are doing just what they want. Um, Stephen Neal's advantage is that his, his cards have been a little bit more powerful and efficient. River Herald's Boon, of course, just fantastic for an early mer Merfolk curve out like this. Uh, Dan Ward's advantage that he was on the play and has cast more spells. So pretty tight race. Let's see what Stephen Neal can do on this pretty big turn. Ooh, how about Waker of the Wilds? Yep. Played pre-combat to trigger the River Sneak. Once again, both players just content to keep racing, it looks like. One of them's got to be wrong here, though. <laughs> like, you can't. Somebody's winning the race. That's true. Although sometimes you you feel like you can't win the race and you can't defend yourself and you have to choose between two not so great options. If Dan was to pump the brakes, he would still have to somehow find an answer to river sneak as that's going to kill him over the course of probably about three turns here. Dan wants to get in with the sleek schooner for four. And looks like he has pumped the brakes, not attacking with the two flying creatures. That shows a little bit of weakness potentially in his hand as if he had even so much as one blocker, you, we might have seen him try to... Uh, I, I guess it would require two blockers before he could attack with everything. Both players looking to set up a win over the course of one or two turns here. This is interesting. Dan Ward has just passed the turn back with all that mana, really giving Steven something to think about. Steven can make a 4-4 here. Only a 3-3 if he wants to attack or block with it. That's right. So he's not going to. He's just going to go ahead and get in with River Sneak. It is two damage. Down to five. Go. And now both players don't want to do any. Wow, just Dan just did nothing for the turn. He did not spend a single of that five mana read. Wow. Strange, right? Yeah, might have, you know, might have blanks in his hand or maybe holding a trick that he's saving for the perfect moment. Maybe he does have something like a dive down, a, a reactive card that he hasn't found a good use for yet. This one's down to the wire. So Dan, first order of business, let me search for a way to see if I can win this turn. 
if there is one, it might be in his best interest to just go for it because Stephen Neal could be passing just with the intent to, to use Waker of the Wilds, that six open mana that might otherwise be very scary may or may not represent an instant. Uh, although Windstrider should certainly be on Dan's radar. From Steven's side, how can I win the game on my turn or over the course of two turns? This is how these, these close races wind up going. Yeah, this one's starting to slip away here from Dan Ward. He simply passes the turn back. Steven is going to go ahead and animate one of his islands. It's now a 4-4. Four -four. So keeping in mind that Waker of the Wilds can add additional counters to an already animated land, mm -hmm. that island is lethal if it ever connects. However, Skittering Heartstopper is, is a pretty good answer to the first land that Stephen Neal invests mana into. And I feel like Dan Ward is uh, you know, still falling behind even if he does trade off that Heartstopper. It's like... I guess Steven's just doing math here. <clears throat> Gonna attack just for two again and bide his time. Yeah, he decides that there's no reason to trade off the island for the Heartstopper because he can wait until he animates a second land. He can even use the, the, the animated island to sink extra mana into the Waker of the Wilds. No need to rush things when the advantage is his with each passing turn. But man, Dan Ward's got to put something together here. If he can kill the Shaper Apprentice. Hey, he oh. found a target for Walk the Plank. Wow. <laughs> oh, man, I wonder how long he's been holding that. Yeah, also interesting uh, to, to think about what he might have seen in the first game that would lead him to, to not sideboard out Walk the Plank. <laughs> Chat's calling it sinkhole. <laughs> <laughs> it's back. All right, island down. Holy cow, Marshall. What are you seeing? St Stephen Neal must have had a real interesting draft because he has, like, an excellent white deck in his sideboard. Double Ixalan Binding, double Territorial Hammer what? Skull, Pious Interdiction. Wow, really? Yeah, and you decided, no, thank you. I can do better with the Blue-Green Merfolk, which it, it does look to me like he's, he's put together an excellent deck here. Waker of the Wilds, nice Tribal Synergies, River Herald's Boon. Still, that's... That's not normal. Look at this. Dan Ward attacking for lethal now. Forcing a block. So, Stephen Neal should certainly block the Shaper Apprentice on the Sleek Schooner, and he should probably put some counters on one of his lands to block the Skittering Heartstopper. Though I guess there's not really anything to worry about that would deal three extra damage. Yeah, this looks like... I don't know. Certainly Dan's in a bad spot and just trying to, to make something happen in the game where... Yeah, yeah. so I, I think the Heartstopper crewed the... That must be the vehicle. case, yeah, yeah. That must be the case. At any rate... Way too far behind. An act of desperation there for Dan Ward, but it's not going to work. Stephen Neal wins the match. Two games to zero. Wow, what a... Yeah, I'm, now I want to talk to Stephen and figure out what the hell happened in that draft because, like, that's weird, right? That's a lot of good white cards. And, you know, Reed, when I think of this format, I don't think of one that offers that level of flexibility. Like, if I burn a bunch of picks on a deck I don't end up using, I find it generally hard to make my playables in the deck that I choose. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. All right, what do we got here? We've got Cole, uh, Cole Gearing. He's playing Kevin Jones. Kevin Jones has been on the American national team in the past. I think it was with, last year even. with Was he with Owen? He was. Yeah, I remember that. I think Owen told him that he should go play more GPs. Then Kevin won one. 
And he was like, you're right. Yeah, Kevin Jones, excellent player. Known him for many, many years. Did you know that he has a very nice jump shot? Yeah, we played basketball with him. Did uh, you know that before we played, though? No, I uh, had no idea. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect either, but that guy can, he can chuck him. Ooh, Kevin Jones playing a deck we've seen in Constructed. White, black tokens, splashing green for Nebraska Relic Seeker. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Not another Cobbled Wings. What is happening here? I guess this is on a green-white deck, so there's likely to have a lot of beef. And just as I say that, it's Blossom Dryad that hits the battlefield. A 2-2 two -two for three. Wow, this, uh, this matchup is Vraska against Huatli Warrior Poet. Really? Yeah, Cole Gearing is, is white-green splashing Huatli. <laughs> oh, man. It's white-black splashing Vraska. Looks like Kevin had taken the first game. And this one uh, looking a lot better for Cole. Well, we got flying dinosaurs. So we got that going for us. Cole has a couple options available to him, or he can pass with Laugh New Sailback mana open, which looks like it's probably going to be the best option. Ironically, he kind of would want to move the Cobbled Wings to Blossom Dryad, but then wouldn't have enough mana if he attacked with the Dryad to cast the sail back. Instead, he's going to give his Pterodon Knight double flying. <laughs> oh, and actually, wow, very conservative to not attack at all. No attack? If you're, if you're on Cold's side. One thing that I did really like about the way he played that turn is he went pretty far out of his way to keep a basic land in his hand, um, protecting his good spells from Deadeye Tormentor or any other discard effect that Kevin Jones might have. Also potentially shielding the fact, you know, that he's playing a... splashing a card, right? Because it was a mountain. Yeah, that's true. And actually, he, he, he's going very far out of his way to do what you just mentioned, hiding that mountain, which could come back to bite him if Kevin actually did have a discard spell. He would have to lose the mountain and potentially be unable to cast <clears throat> Watley if she came off the top later. Well, he's finally attacking. He played uh, Pious Interdiction on Anointed Deacon, which is, well, it's a remarkably it. poor yeah. <laughs> answer to that card. <laughs> it really is. It, it doesn't get in the red zone that often, but. Ooh, and there she is. The warrior poet herself. Wow. <laughs> he wasted no time playing the mountain now, did he, Reed? He's ready to rumble. Interesting position he finds himself in now. Oh, you're not going to like this, Kevin Jones. Taking a quick read of Watley. <laughs> she's, well, she's something else. Yeah. Probably just going to start making dinosaurs. That's kind of your baseline move with Watley is just start spitting out these 3-3 three, three dinos. Yeah, particularly good with, with the cobbled wings. 3-3 three, three flying dinosaurs. Yeah. Though not very good against Shining Aerosaur. That's true. If Kevin has a removal spell for the Grazing Whiptail, this is going to be a pretty good turn for him because he then gets to attack and either force a jump block or take out the Planeswalker. Contract killing? No. Ugh. Not what Kevin Bishop wanted. Of the, of the Bloodstained. A fine magic card. <laughs> but way off par for what he wanted to be doing here. This is a disaster for Kevin Jones. Now he has to pass the turn back, and Cole just gets to keep spitting out these dinosaurs. It's going to be very difficult now for Kevin Jones to, uh, to see all of the match in this game here.
if I was in Cole's position, I, I wouldn't hate just main phasing the sail back and putting cobbled wings on it. It's not like you're going to ambush a creature from Kevin attacking you on the ground. That's almost impossible for that to happen. Right. And you do want to play around a, a removal spell for the grazing whiptail. Yeah, I like your line there. Sad news for Kevin Jones. He found Vraska. Can't cast a. At, at least that means he's one step away from casting her instead of two. It's true. Unlike the original printing of Vraska, she cannot destroy other planeswalkers, but she could take out a creature, a cobbled wings, a pious interdiction. She could make a 2 2 menace wow. token. Did you see that? Cole did not cast the sail back. He didn't main phase it, but he also didn't cast it on Kevin's turn either. He really wants to try to get some value out of that thing, I guess. Yeah, another I thing. I mean, that's he a could good attacker doing. here, right? Sure, yeah. He could put cobbled wings on it, attack for four, and then move cobbled wings back to a different creature. Oh, yeah. You got to get that thing in. All right, now what the hell's going on here? What is this? What combat trick did you find? He might be intending to use Swatley's minus ability just after to, combat. Just to finish off. Nope, he just replaced it with the dinosaur. Well, color me confused here. He did chip in for three. I guess if you get to play limited with a planeswalker in play, you, you don't want it to be over too quickly. You want to make <laughs> it your 15 minutes. I like it. Oh, uh, Cole is definitely all about that value. But he could have a full four on the battlefield just turning sideways. And, yeah, now it's, again, it's one removal spell away from Wadley potentially biting yeah. the dust. And Kevin could get back into this game if that happens. I mean, he obviously is not going to be that lucky and draw one, right? That's not how justice works, but... Kevin has Slash of Talons in his hand, which is, has been very poor this game. Yeah. So the risk of a situational removal spell is when the situation doesn't come up, it's just a brick in your hand. God, two lands and uh, Slash of Talons, really bad hand for Kevin. Well, don't forget Vraska. <laughs> yeah, Vraska, Vraska would certainly change things. Let me take a look at... at Kevin's splash here. He has one forest, one unknown shores. Yeah, look at this. Cole is going to chump block here. No, no treasures for Kevin Jones. So this is a this is about as greedy as splashes get. You know, about as greedy as they get in the in the realm of still being reasonable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Slash of Talons is going to kill the Dagger Tooth. Dinosaur is going to die to the Aerosaur. Cobble Wings is going to fall off of it, and he's passing the turn back, but... And there we go. Finally, he plays the Snapping Sail back this turn. Hey, look, more dinosaurs. Cole should feel relatively comfortable with his long-term game plan here, though, as Watley just generates serious advantage every turn. 3-3 three, three Tramplers, that is no joke. Those will simply overwhelm Kevin Jones if he doesn't find an answer for Watley at some point. <clears throat> and now Cole is properly shields up because even if one of the two potential blockers were to die, the other one is still there to protect Watley's loyalty from the uh, Shining Aerosaur. Kevin found his forest. No. So really? I had been about to ask, if you do get to cast Vraska, what is your first move with her? Huh. Wow, that's super interesting. I mean, it feels like you have to start killing creatures. If you just start making pirates, you can lean on her loyalty, but the dinosaurs are going to outclass those pirates. And with the life total discrepancy being not in Kevin Jones's favor, he's going to have a really hard time, I think. Ooh. Oh, sheltering light off the top for Cole. Because Kevin did minus Vraska. She should be at three. Yeah. Kevin actually could be dead on board if Cole decides to use 
Quat leaves minus ability to make Kevin's creatures unable to block. But based on Cole playing pretty uh, conservatively so far in this game, it's, it's not clear that he will make that play. He also could decide to... Um, looks like the players are maybe not on the same page about what happened with Vraska. Oh, okay. So Kevin definitely did use the minus three ability, and it resolved, which means he gets a treasure, but it did not successfully kill the creature. That makes sense. All right, well, that's Crushing Canopy, which Cole had scribed to the top. That's going to kill the Aerosaur, and it's yeah. one way or another he's going he's gonna to win this game. You know, whether it takes him one turn or two, I think it's, it's lights out for Kevin Jones. Yeah, it turns out one of these players got their Planeswalker down way sooner than the other. Oh, it looks like Cole is going to get aggressive and say these two can't block. <clears throat> But he also could have just killed the Shining Aerosaur and then made it so the other two couldn't block, leaving Jones with no blockers. And he's out of gas anyway. And as we can see, that will do it. So Cole Gearing is going to even things up here. Watley first. She got the job done. Take that, Vraska. You're going to have to be on time if you're going to want to beat that particular race, though I think she could do it. Looks like Cole also splashing off of two sources of red mana, one mountain, one rootbound crag. Wonder if there's much Kevin Jones can do here, given what he's seen. Well, maybe I could tell you. Kevin Jones, his sideboard has some Death Touch creatures and Skittering Heart Stopper. The Grim Captain's Call. He has access to some Life Gain, Ritual of Rejuvenation, or Priest of the Awakening Sun. An extra copy of Legion's Judgment, which uh, you would think that the game would play out in a way where either Slash of Talons would be really good or Legion's Judgment would be really good, but actually that game, all of Cole's creatures seem to be 3-3s, three so neither of those too exciting. He could bring in Demystify for the Pious Interdiction. Pious Intervention. It is Pious Interdiction. But looks it like uh, having dabbled in a couple different colors, Kevin doesn't have access to any, any great stuff on his sideboard. Cole also looked to be pretty solidly in three different colors during the draft. <clears throat> with a lot of red cards in his sideboard, he actually does have a bonded horncrest in his main deck to go with his Planeswalker Splash. He also has some cool stuff like Captain Lannery Storm, a couple good dinosaurs, Tilanali's Knight. I'm sure at certain points in the draft he, he considered that he might have used red as a main color. To go with his dino synergies there. Right. So we saw that video from Owen at Worlds. He, was he lit Captain Lannery Storm or was it Jensen? Jensen. And then that means that Owen was Beckett Brass. Who were you? Mm. Did you abstain from the shenanigans? Or? Mostly abstained. It was actually both Owen and Huey were both Lannery Storm and Beckett Brass. Oh, it's true. <laughs> see, <laughs> see. <laughs> Oh, man, you poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> you were caught in the middle of that nonsense? The thing is, there's not, there, there aren't very many rules or guidelines for how the nonsense is supposed to work. <laughs> it's just the more nonsensical, the better. <laughs> All right. I won't question it. I'll just enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, boy, Cole down to five cards. Uh-oh. Looks like a pretty good five, though. He has two lands. Okay. Including a dual land? Yep, so if he can find white mana, that means he's, he's all set on all of his colors. Meanwhile, hmm. Kevin Jones. Ooh, look at that. He's already got his green mana in case he draws Vraska down the line here. Oh, no. Cobbled Wings. 
Ugh, I am not a big cobbled wig fan in general, but this is where it really shows up as painful is when you've mulliganed a bunch and you've got a card in your deck that has such low impact like cobbled wings. Well it, said. It really stings, you know. Cole wanting to protect his uh, Blossom Dryad there to make sure that he can start casting stuff. Boy, Marshall, and after all of that, the mulligans and the uh, the two land opening hand, it's Kevin Jones who's having mana, mana troubles now. Wow, look at this. Bonded Horncrest all of a sudden threatening to apply a lot of pressure unless Kevin has a removal spell here. Though he can have one just to kill the <laughs> Dryad and effectively nullify the, the Horncrest too, but... Yeah, I don't like Cole's decision there. I think he should have played his five mana card, the Ceratops, because now he is forced into the decision of either he puts his Blossom Dryad into combat or he doesn't or he uses it for mana, and uh, if, if he does the latter, which which he did, he yeah. can't attack with the Bonded Horde Crest. Yeah, did Kevin miss an attack there, too? Well, Kevin perhaps thought that he wanted to make sure Cole couldn't attack with the Blossom Dryad on the ground to enable the Horn Crest. Okay. So he, by leaving back the 2-2, two -two, he was going to force Cole to invest in additional mana okay. if he wanted to attack with both creatures. That makes sense. Kevin is in survival mode here and needs to slow down Cole a bit. Though that being said, he's at 20. Kevin is, so he's not in dire straits. No, and he did find his white mana unlocking nice defensive cards like some life gain creatures, pious intervention, interdiction. <laughs> <laughs> I think they mean the same thing. Ooh, look at this. Cole is getting aggressive now. He's had enough sitting around. And he has sent every creature into the red zone. Now Kevin is going to look to try to trade as much as possible off here. I mean, if, if he knew the Cole had nothing, he would just trade off all the ground creatures. Yep. And leave the Bonded Horde Crest on its own. But it's pretty risky business given that <laughs> Cole is in the, the one, two, and three spot here for combat tricks and removal spells at instant speed, and it's just super risky. But Kevin's yeah. going to take the risk. I love this block from Kevin. It's exactly what I would do. Yeah. Is he, did he point to the Blossom Dryad? Is he, is he saving his smaller of the two creatures? Yes. I don't know why. Maybe he feels like he needs the mana going forward? That's strange. It's a huge difference when you have a Bonded Horn Crest because you need a, a bigger creature to be able to keep attacking down on the ground. If Kevin just plays a 2-3 here, he just bricks Cole's board. Or at least makes Cole move the cobbled wings around or something. My play there would have been to use Slash of Talons on uh, one of the creatures blocking the Ceratops. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would kill the Paladin there or the token. Yeah, I think it's more valuable to have the Ceratops in play and it's more valuable to have the Sheltering Light in, in hand than the Slash of Talons. I mean, having just wiped up Kevin's small creatures, the Slash of Talons might really not do anything for the rest of the game. Not a super strong follow-up here. Skyblade of the Legion. He, he could attack with both, mm -hmm. you know, and use the Slash of Talons to finish off the creature. Though he should have done that before playing his Skyblade. Oh, and he should also resolve combat damage here. Oh, no. Is he going to get blown out? Oh, no. Cole gets a little bit jumpy there and fires off a Slash of Talons and gets re-slashed of Talons by Kevin Jones perhaps opening the door for Kevin to make a comeback here. Oh, no. This one could fall apart on Cole if he's not careful. Very costly mistake from Cole. If you have uh, a situation like that where you know your creature is going to die in combat either way, it's much better and safer to resolve the combat damage so that the Shining Aerosaur already has two damage. Then during the end of combat step, you can use the Slash of Talons. Yeah, the creature is still designated as an attacker and or a blocker during that, st th during that time. It is a subtle rules interaction, but there's a very real cost for not knowing that interaction. And boy, did Cole just feel it there from Kevin Jones. Ouch. Kevin has continued to hit his land drops now. That certainly isn't an issue for him at this point.
And there's that pious interdiction to take down the big threat. And all of a sudden, Cole Gehring's board is a 1-3 flyer and a 1-1 one, one dog on the ground. That's it. Kevin Jones is going to get in. No good blocks there for Cole, who's really hoping to find something. And boy, did he. Yeah, that's pretty good. Shining Aerosaur off the top of the library is a nice little draw for him. That actually shores up the, the board entirely. Jeez, that had to be one of his better draws looking at it. He just went from significantly behind to at parity with that one draw step. He's got to be happy about that. Still, it's a precarious spot he finds himself in. Any removal spells or re realistically even a combat trick from Kevin Jones could get him back out of this and get the damage flowing again back in Cole's direction. Who can draw their Planeswalker first? That is certainly one of the big questions here as the players find themselves in a bit of a face-off, though Kevin has something. Well, that's actually decent anointed deacon here. He does have a couple of vampires on the battlefield. He can uh. pump up the paladin. Yeah, he doesn't want to do it on the Vampire Token because either the Encampment Keeper or the Shining Aerosaur can eat that. Now, he does have uh, Vampire Zeal in hand, so maybe maybe I spoke too soon, and, and that could be something that's on the table. So he targets the Paladin of the Bloodstain, which now safely trades up. Wow, so desperate times here for Cole Gearing. He makes a reasonable block there. Aerosaur and Aerosaur has to chump block the other one. And the Aerosaur fight, he loses anyway thanks to Vampire Zeal. And this one has really slipped away from him here. He is not facing lethal with that dog he can chump block, but we're talking desperate times here for Cole Gearing. We're going to see Kevin Jones lay the beats down here on this tax step. In fact, I think he could just win here. Let's see. Block that, pump that, block that. Three, six, seven. Yeah, that's plenty enough. Bishop of the Bloodstained pre-combat. Yeah, yep. Bishop of the Bloodstained plus Bishop Soldier is actually enough for five damage there pre-combat, and that means that that attack is lethal, and Kevin Jones picks up the match. Two games to one over Cole Gearing here in round five. We'll be back with more magic after these messages. <laughs> 